Here's some reminders to help you get the most out of your dive geometry lectures. First, it's important to remember what mathematics is. It's considered the language of science and God gave it to us first as a tool for studying his created patterns that involve number and shape and then we can use those to create our own pattern. Mathematics is also a way for us to interact with other people such as when we buy or sell things and it's a way for us to develop deductive reasoning skills which are basically when we have rules, a set of rules and we apply those in a new situation to learn something new. That's what deductive reasoning is about. Now this geometry course is mostly about something called Euclidean geometry and over 2,300 years ago a man named Euclid he wrote the elements that was a series of 13 books and he had a process of beginning with 23 definitions five axioms and five postulates which are considered self-evident truths and he went on to logically prove 465 theorems from that so as you go through this book you'll notice that you'll be following a similar process that Euclid did and actually this process of having definitions some rules and then using those in new situations that's that deductive reasoning process you can learn any subject that way and you'll probably notice that learning style in a lot of different subjects that you've studied now as you do a dive lecture it's important that you work problems with me and take notes the dive lectures work best when you have three things that come together and work together you see me writing things on the screen and you hear me talking and then you are also doing something you are taking notes on what I write working practice problems that I present math and music have a lot in common they're both about patterns and in music you see some notes and you hear the keys like on a piano you hear the sound and you're doing something too you're using your fingers so that's why this is called an interactive video education is because you need to be doing something too you need to be taking notes working problems with me and you also need to pause and rewind the lecture until you understand the concept if you don't understand something that I'm talking about just rewind it go back over it and next I recommend doing at least three homework sets which would be about 90 problems and a test each week and as long as you're doing this how you're supposed to taking notes working problems along with me on the lectures this is a good way to do it and in a normal week you would have four lessons that you would complete so you watch the dive lectures take notes on those four lessons do homework on the last three and then you take a test I found that this is plenty of math for most students and if you're not consistently making A's and B's on your weekly tests then that is a sign that you probably do need to either slow down or do all the homework each week next check your answers after you finish the entire homework set complete the whole homework set and whether you have an answer key or a solutions manual use that when you're finished don't flip to it at the end of each problem and show your work the key to showing a good amount of work is that you show enough work that you can tell where your mistake is if you can see where your mistakes are then you're showing enough work and last, have a good attitude. The best math program in the world won't make a bit of difference if you have a bad attitude, if you're complaining about having to do your math. If you're homeschooling, your parents have bought this CD for you, and their goal is to give you the best education possible. So honor your parents, and that's a command in the Ten Commandments. That's the fifth commandment that God tells children. They need to honor their parents so things will go well for them. Honor your parents by making a good effort with your mathematics and having a thankful heart, a thankful attitude, and I'm sure God will bless you for your effort. Lesson one is on points, lines, and planes, and before you start this lesson, make sure you do that warm-up section at the beginning. Sometimes that will contain review questions that will help you review some important topics in geometry and in algebra, as well as certain skills that are important in mathematics, and you see those letters that says SB next to some of the problems in the warm-up section that refers to the skills bank and that's in the back of your book so if you were wanting for example to look at a problem that related to skills bank number five you would flip to the back of the book and find that and learn about that particular skill they want you to understand so if you haven't done the warm-up yet go ahead and pause this lecture and do your warm-up and then turn the lecture back on and take notes on it well geometry is mainly about the study of shape and we make shapes by using points lines and things called planes and to start with let's go ahead and look at some definitions but first let's describe what a definition is let's define definition 
And definitions, those are statements that say nothing of the existence of things defined, so that their existence must be proved. Now, Aristotle said thousands of years ago that exceptions to this in geometry, those include definitions of points and lines. So all other definitions and the existence of those things, those must be proved. So definitions describe what something is. That's a key thing to remember here. Definitions describe what something is. They don't prove its existence, though. And this description comes out of Euclid's 13 Elements, and here's the ISBN number for that book. It's printed by Dover Publications, and that's a book you might want to go ahead and purchase if you haven't done that already. The Saxon Geometry course doesn't go into a lot of the history of geometry, but I think that's important. I think it's important to understand that, and I think it's very interesting to see how these rules that have been used for thousands of years are still in place today. They haven't changed. Some people might tell you that everything is relative, but that's not true. There are absolutes out there, and geometry is one place where we can study absolutes. And so this definition here for a point, that which has no part, that definition is the same. It's, it was the same when Euclid was alive. It's the same today. A line is a breathless length. Now what does that mean, though? Well, breadth, that means width. So when we draw a line, we can see it has a thickness to it. It has a width, but that just describes its location. And this may be confusing, but the best way to think about a line, it's just an idea of something that has a length that goes on and on, but it has no width. And one way to think about it may be that you know, I can draw another line here that's not quite as thick as the first one, but it's also a line, and I can draw another one that's thinner than that, and so on and so on and so on. So the best way to define a line is not to define it as having some specific width to it. It's a breathless length. And understanding that, hopefully that will make sense that a point, you know, if you draw a point, it would look like a little dot, like a period. But again, look at the period right here. It's smaller than that yellow point that I just drew. And of course, I could draw a smaller one, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we don't define a specific thickness for that point. We just say it's that which has no part. We have to identify its location somehow, so we use a pencil or a pen or a computer to make a point. But in reality, it's just an idea. Well, let's continue with some other definitions. Remember, definitions describe what something is. And collinear, that means a set of points that lie on the same line. And therefore, non-collinear, that would be a set of points that do not lie on the same line. Now, Euclid's first postulate says that it takes at least two points to define a line. We'll talk about that more in Lesson 4, but just for now, understand that that is one of the postulates. It takes at least two points to define a line. Okay, so we've talked about points, lines. Now, let's define a surface. That is something which has length and breadth only. So it's like a line, except that it has breadth also. It's not a breadthless length. It has breadth as well as length. It has both. And take that one step further, a plane. What that is is a flat surface that has no thickness and extends forever. So it's a surface, but it has no thickness, kind of like a line has no breadth. The difference would be that it extends forever as opposed to just a regular surface. So it would go off the page, basically. And some other definitions here. Coplanar that's a set of points or lines that lie on the same plane. And then intersection, that would be the point or set of points in which two figures meet. Two lines, they would intersect at a single point. Two planes, they would intersect at a line. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do some practice problems now. And remember, you're supposed to be taking notes on the lectures, and you should have written those definitions down we just covered. For this problem, you can redraw this if you want to. You don't have to, but the main thing you want to write on your paper are the answers to the different questions here, A through H. So
So you can pause the lesson and try to answer them yourself, or just go ahead and go along with me and do these while I explain them. So for A, identify all the lines. Well, we see there's a line M, and so we would just write a lowercase m there, and we see line F, G, and so we see the G and the F right there. And so what we would do for that is we would have an F, G and we put an arrow over the top of it. That's the best way to describe that. And notice too when we draw lines they're usually drawn with arrows at each end. Then we also have line Y. So you can see there's two ways that are mainly used to describe lines. They may have just one letter for a name or there's two points that define that line like BK and so we would write those letters usually in alphabetical order. It doesn't matter really but that's kind of normally how it's done and you put that arrow with the arrow heads at each end over the top of those two points. Problem B, let's define all the planes. Well there's just two planes here and we can write the word plane, P-L-A-N-E, -E, plane A and G. Okay, for C, we need to find a pair of collinear points. That means two points that are on the same line. Well, that could be F and G. That pair would work. B and K would work. Now, it just takes two points to define a line, so any pair of points here would actually work. A and K, that would be a pair of collinear points, even though we don't have a line going through A and K. There's no line there described on the diagram. We know that those two points could define a line. So there's lots of answers here for practice problem C. Now in D, we want to look at two sets of non-collinear points. So to describe a set, we could say parentheses F, comma, G, and D, comma, E. Those two sets of points are not on the same line. Another example would be F and G and B and K. There's a lot of different options here. And you just have to de describe two sets of non-collinear points. You don't have to do all of the ones that are in this diagram. In D, identify four coplanar points. So that means four points that are on the same plane. So we can see F, B, D, and E. Those four points are on the same plane. So you would just write for an answer points F, B, D, and E. And then in E, identify two coplanar lines, so two lines that are on the same plane. Well, M and line BK, those are on the same plane, those are coplanar. But line BK, if you look at it, it's basically the intersection of those two planes, so it lies on both of them. So we could also say line Y and line BK. That's another option there, but we only have to do one of those. But just so you know, both of those pairs work. Next for problem F, identify two non-coplanar lines, two lines that are not on the same plane. Well, line M, we can look at that one, and we could also see line Y, just looking at those two, pretty apparent that they are not on the same plane. And of course there's several options here too. Line FG and line M, those are not on the same plane. Even though we don't show a plane for FG, it does lie in some plane. Line Y and FG, those would also not be in the same plane. Line BK and FG would be non-coplanar as well. Okay, problem G, what is the intersection of line F, G, and plane A? Well, let's just go over to line F, G, and 
we can just follow that down until that dashed line starts and that's basically where it hits the plane and in the geometry textbooks, action geometry, you'll see these dashed lines like that. That means it's basically underneath the plane. It's uh, identifying a hidden line. Just pretend like that plane, you can't really see through it, but you need to follow the path of that line. So that's dashed line is representing its hidden path behind the plane or underneath the plane. And then we can see it again when it comes back out right there. So the intersection of a line and a plane, that's a point. And so we would just say point F. That's the intersection. And then problem H, what is the intersection of plane A and plane G? Well, remember the intersection of two planes is a line. And so we can see that line BK going right through the intersection of those two planes or identifying that intersection. So we would just say B and we can write the word line and then say BK or we can do BK with the arrows over the top and the small line over the top. Okay, well that's all for lesson one.